Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Blaschenberg, and I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. And today we're talking about what does breastfeeding look like in the first week of baby's life? So to have this conversation, we have one of my all-time favorite people, Andrea Sims Brown. You will hear me literally glowing and giggling as we have this conversation. And in full disclosure, I have known Andrea for almost 20 years. Not only did she help support me with breastfeeding two children, she was with PYC for, I think, around 17 years. She's an amazing person. She's an IBCLC. Let me tell you a little bit about her. So Andrea Sims-Brown is the founder and owner of Babies in the Family, a New York City-based virtual lactation support and education company. Drawing from her decade plus of baby nurse experience, infant massage instruction, and private research, all families benefit from Andrea's proven technique and evidence-based approach to breastfeeding. Employing both modern and ancient techniques, over 89% of her clients exceed their own goals in breastfeeding. She is full of knowledge. She even starts to talk about at the end of our conversation what it takes to be an IBSCLC. So she is the real deal. And in this conversation, Andrea breaks down the realistic expectations of what we should expect a baby in the first 24 to 48 hours and then throughout the first few weeks of their life. Baby's tummies are teeny. And sometimes as new parents, we keep thinking, feed the baby, feed the baby. But here's a little information that Andrea told me years and years and years ago. A teaspoon is all a baby needs in the first day or so. And then their baby, their tummies get bigger. A teaspoon. So sometimes we think they should be gulping down full breasts and yet their tummies are just tiny. So you're going to learn so much in this amazing conversation. Before we get to that, I just want to say thank you because our community continues to show up as we shift. So we are having more and more in-person classes at Prenatal Yoga Center on the Upper West Side, but we haven't forgotten about our online classes. So thank you for continuing to support us as we support you through this transition of pregnancy, parenthood, and however you choose to to nourish your child. Now also head to our new website. I'm so excited about that and grab our free downloadable five simple solutions to the most common pregnancy pains. Now I always remind you while I say pregnancy pains, all these things are totally applicable to postpartum pains, back pain, shoulder pain, lower back pain, achiness. I got you covered. Grab the downloadable. There'll be something there to help support you. And then the last thing I want to mention is that we're going to continue the cycle of how we've been doing our prenatal yoga teacher training. So if you are someone that wants to take a very deep dive, evidence-based information into the world of teaching and supporting prenatal and postnatal folks through the path of yoga, check out our 85-hour online and in-person teacher training. We'll do two in-person a year and two online a year. So you can run to our website and check that out. And then the last thing I want to ask of you is if you have a moment, even pause right now, please leave a rating and review so people can continue to find this podcast. It's not really even about me. It's about what we can offer our community and the amazing guests that we have that can offer their knowledge to the community. So I'm hoping that what we give, you can help give back to others in the community. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, please enjoy my delightful conversation with Andrea. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? 
And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Andrea, I am so excited to speak with you. In fact, any opportunity I can speak with you is just so wonderful. So Mm -hmm. welcome back. I think this might be your third episode with us. I'm not sure. Thanks, Deb. It's always fun to, ch- fun to chat with you because we've known each other for so long. Yeah. Um, this is my second podcast with you okay, and I second. did, uh, I think, an uh, IG live at some point. Yes. Last yes, year or the com- year before. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. always love talking to you. You are so full of knowledge. And as we were talking about before we hit record, you helped me immensely with both my babies. So it is just, it's always wonderful to pick at your amazing brain. So I guess we're going to jump right in. So let's have other people, because I know about you, but let's have you share a little bit about yourself and how you landed in the world of lactation in newborn care. Certainly. Um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, I worked as a baby nurse in New York City and I worked with the kind of families that you never hear about because they're so fabulously wealthy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're the people who live on the top floor of the fa- mansion on Park <laughs> Avenue. And, um, and I got really good at it. And a, pediatri- a couple of pediatricians asked me to you know, consider going to medical school to become a pediatrician, but my interest lay mostly in lactation and human lactation science. And so um, in the late 90s, I started to study human lactation science and I did the certification exam in 2000 and I've been a private practice IBCLC since then. And you're brilliant at what you do. So that is why it's so amazing that people can learn from you. So we're going to talk about what breastfeeding looks like in the first week, especially those first 48 hours. I know things definitely change. So when someone gives birth right at that golden hour, when should they expect to start to breastfeed? It's true that babies are born to breastfeed, meaning when they're born, they're primed with the curiosity for latching. And so the current recommendation, and it's been around for quite a few centuries, is to have your baby latch on as soon as you give birth. Now, for families who've not given birth to their own baby, the key is the minute that you can get to skin to skin with your baby, which is the condition under women tend to give birth, any lactating person can simply take their top off and have that baby help that baby to latch on to their breast. So like right after, like within an hour, within two hours, are there certain signs? Because I remember as a doula that sometimes people would would introduce the breast and the baby wasn't all that interested. They were more interested in their hand. So are there certain signs to look for that baby's ready to start this adventure? Absolutely. That interest in hands is the signal for I'm interested in your breast, but I haven't been introduced to your breast yet. (laughs) So (laughs) this baby has spent quite some time sort of getting to know their own hands. And so ideally, within an hour of giving birth, your oxytocin levels are at its highest. And oxytocin is the hormone that's responsible for squeezing the milk out of your breasts. And in that first hour, you're producing, and for a couple of days, you're producing a very thick honey-like consistency of milk called colostrum that simply makes it easy for newborn babies to attach and suckle and swallow without being concerned about drowning. So yes, within the hour of birth is the ideal time, particularly if you notice. I love that you remember that from your dueling days. Um, if your baby is interested in his or her hands, ideally you would sort of say, well, guess what? I have something that's even juicier <laughs> and that's called my breast. Get to know it. <laughs> what if they're not showing those signs yet? Right. If you're not showing those signs yet, no problem. All you need to do is hold your baby against your body, skin to skin. Skin to skin meaning the baby's topless with a blanket maybe behind his or her back and the lactating family, whoever's choosing to do actual lactating, that person will hold that baby against their heart, which is the space between your breasts. And most babies, even babies who are born with issues, you know, health issues, will start seeking the breast, will start seeking a 
an area to latch onto and suckle. So lots of snuggling and that leads to latching. All right. That makes sense. So because I know one thing we definitely want to talk about was the importance of skin to skin. Is there more you want to go into that and how that affects breastfeeding? Oh my gosh. Skin to skin is like a magic bullet. <laughs> Maybe that's not the right analogy, but it really gets babies primed and not babies, but also the lactating person because, you know, that skin to skin contact increases your oxytocin levels. It lets your body flora be aware that something has changed. And for someone who's given birth and, con- and considering lactating, it's the number one recommendation for triggering the, um, increase in milk production. In other words, it signals through the scent of the baby against mom's uh, chest for women who've given birth themselves that, you know, that scent, there's a feedback system when you smell your baby and your baby smells you, literally there is a part of your brain that says, whoa, are we going to lactate? Well, then let's do this. Where's that kid? Where's that kid? Let's go. And your breasts get really excited. I mean, I say that and it sounds funny, but there is actual evidence to prove that the brain is aware that this is happening and starts the process of creating milk production, actually making milk in the breasts just that, from snuggling. That is amazing. I hadn't actually, I don't think I actually knew that. So that's how the baby can help stimulate milk production. Is that something that if someone's concerned about their milk production, the skin to skin can help help with that? Absolutely. You know, for families who've adopted or, you know, had a loss, you know, the the birthing parent has an issue with health and somebody else is going to lactate. That's the first thing I say is get naked, get topless, get into bed and start snuggling with that newborn baby because it does, you know, we're, we're animals. We are animals, as much as we wear clothing and we live in nice houses and drive cars, we are animals that are very primal state. And so the body will react and do its job. So yes, absolutely. Even for mothers with low supply or women or any family who's adopted a baby, um, cross nursing, just get topless. It's definitely helpful. Oh, I love that. So will you talk also about the importance of a deep attachment and easy ways to get that deep latch? As I was talking to you before, one of the things I remember from your class and something that always stuck with me through my days of nursing was what the baby's lips would look like. I always call them trumpety. <laughs> Is that what you mean by that deep latch? Well, you know, when we talk about trumpety or uh, K lips, what we're trying to have is the baby's lips turned outward, right? Because right. it's it, the, the lips are designed to stabilize the entire areola so that the tongue can function by suckling. So that sounds like goobly gawk to the average listener, but here's what we're trying to achieve. The reason that the person's areola becomes darker and larger is because human babies at birth and for a few days can see high contrast. So even on, even on people who have very dark skin, the areola becomes somewhat reflective and babies see this. And so having a baby latch onto your areola is key. And the way that we can get that deep attachment is by simply narrowing or compressing the areola parallel to a baby's lips. You know, in human lactation science, we call that a breast sandwich. And I remember thinking about this in the 90s and thinking, that is a genius way of thinking about it. If you're going to bite into a sandwich, particularly if it's a pretty hefty sandwich, you're going to flatten that sandwich parallel to your lips. In other words, you're going to hold it in front of your mouth and you're going to apply pressure to that sandwich where your nose is and where your chin is. That's how we get a large surface area into our mouth. So it works for babies. And so getting a deep attachment simply means getting as much of your areola and the areola is the large pigmented circle of skin around your nipple to get as much of that on your baby's tongue when that's on the chin side of baby's mouth. I still remember all this from your class and I still remember <laughs> literally Joey and I, like he took notes and he was oh. like, we have to sandwich the boob. We have to get the, we have to get the trumpety. Like literally those were the things that we both remembered from that experience 11 years ago. So it oh, stuck wow. with me because it worked. And right. something else you were saying that really kind of popped into my med, my head was that our bodies are so smart. So the areola becomes darker, even with darker skin, it's shiny. Like our bodies are offering an easy pathway for baby. It's just, that blows my mind. That's right. 
That's so, right. Your body knows what's going on. I know. It's so smart. So let's talk about the expectation of babies and feeding in this first 24 to 48 hours. Because I think before I got into this world of perinatal, I hadn't really thought like they have these teeny tiny stomachs to start with. And maybe there's this idea like feed the baby, feed the baby. Like they don't get a ton, if I remember correctly, because their tummies are so small. So how much and how often should a parent expect a baby to eat in the first 24 to 48 hours? Okay. So let's back up a little bit, right? This is a newborn human. All his or her entire existence, he's been in an environment where all of his food, nutrition, everything is brought to him on a silver platter called an umbilical stump. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the highest end restaurant on the planet. You don't even have to order it. It just shows up when your body needs it. So those rules tend to follow. When a newborn baby comes into the world, they come into the world expecting that nutrition, those nutrients to be presented to them pretty timely. And so what's cool about newborn babies is they're very clear about what they need. They have very little social graces. And so when your newborn baby starts yelling, you, you've you missed the early hunger cues. And so because they're not born with an appetite, we offer them that colostrum, which is a small volume feed. You said that they have tiny stomachs because they haven't started eating and digesting yet. And so right at birth, ideally, baby would be able to latch on and breastfeed or nurse. And every time you notice that your baby is grimacing or sucking on his or her hands or simply you know, um, moving shoulders around and sticking his tongue out. It's a way of your baby letting you know, you know what, let's try this snacking thing that you've been offering me from from the time I was born. So there's no real, well, baby must nurse six to eight times in 24 hours for the first 24 hours because they come into the world expecting small meals often. So what we, what works is looking at your baby, observing their cues and babies will always tell us what they need by Facial expressions, you know, so if you notice your baby's grimacing, that's baby's way of saying, you know what, I'm ready for a little snack. And those snacks could be as long as five to 10 minutes. It's not usually a long feeding. They're just learning how to actually take in food and digest these meals. So if parents are concerned, there's, you know, five, 10 minutes, how do they know if baby's getting enough at that time? Because again, their tummies are so small. Oh, let's talk about how small a a human baby's stomach is. The size of a champagne grape. You know, those champagne grapes, they're like little marbles. They're really delicate little things. They're about, babies can hold about a teaspoon of food when they're born. So go to your kitchen drawer, pull out the teaspoon measurement, put some water in it and throw it down the counter. That's it. That's as much as a baby can hold. But you'll notice maybe three or four hours later that he's making that sucking sound or sucking on his hands or rooting, which is sort of eyes closed and moving the head around with the mouth open, that's maybe going, okay, I'm ready for another teaspoon. And because they're just coming into the world and just starting to nourish themselves, the meals are frequent, but tiny, tiny meaning a tablespoon would be a lot. Yeah. I remember in my doula bag, I had plastic teaspoons because Mm -hmm. every now and then we would put the colostrum on the teaspoon and then feed that to the baby if there's any issue or if they're in the NICU. Yeah. I mean, you taught me this. I'm not. (laughs) But I love that. But but I love that because, you know, you've given yourself over to the knowledge and, and educating families about what really, what babies really need because too many babies come out of a birthing center, not so much birthing centers, but hospitals having had, you know, an ounce, which is 30 mLs of formula. So they come into the world and they get this huge meal. And like anybody, I'm overweight, I'll tell you, if you've been overeating for some time, then when it's time for you to eat what's appropriate, you know, you're kind of a bit grumpy. So it's important that you remember to share that with your clients because these tiny stomachs, they only need a tiny bit, a teaspoon every four or five hours is usually more than enough for babies to thrive and to trigger lactation. So with that, so in the beginning, it's that teeny champagne grape, and then it's about a teaspoon. What does the trajectory of growth for that baby's stomach look like within about the first week or or even month? Because it grows pretty quickly, doesn't it? 
Oh, yeah, it does. You're right. It's amazing how quickly baby stomachs grow. And it's simply reacting to the introduction of food. So if you've ever tried to lose weight, you know, your nutritionist will say to you, eat half of what you normally eat and your stomach will shrink. Because again, the human body is an amazing animal. So baby will drink about a teaspoon for the first couple of days at each feeding. And that could be, as we said, hourly, or it could be every three to four hours, somewhere like that. And as baby removes the colostrum in those first couple of days, that's what triggers the milk production to happen. As it happens and the milk production increases, baby's stomach grows to accommodate the introduction of extra milk. So what does that mean? A day or the, a two day old baby will drink about maybe three or four teaspoons at most. And by the time that baby is three to four days of age, he can easily hold about half an ounce, maybe an ounce. And all the way up to a month, the stomach grows to about, to, to hold between three and five ounces. And those, those numbers are really arbitrary because I have met hundreds of babies who at five days of age will comfortably drink two and a half to three ounces. So, When we're breastfeeding or nursing from our bodies, the goal is to let baby decide when he or she is done with breastfeeding. What are the signs of that? Ah, love that question. A satiated baby could lay on his or her back unattended. What does that mean? Well, I fed my baby. I laid him down for just a few seconds and I looked at him. And if you look down at your baby after he's been fed and he's laying there and sort of casually looking around his room, judging your taste and decor (laughs) (laughs) and not complaining about it, he or she is letting you know, I'm satiated. And now you can help me to fall asleep. So because we know they're not eating that much, that usually takes anywhere between 35 minutes and 65 minutes to be fully satiated. And this is for the person who's given birth and it's their first baby. But if it's baby number three or baby number four, then that's probably down to like maybe 15 to 20 minutes because every time you lactate, you make more milk Mm -hmm. and it moves faster. So just to keep it simple, ideally you would look at your baby, observe their cues. And if your baby after nursing has started to suck on his or her hands, he's probably saying, I could use a little bit more. That makes sense. Okay. When we come back, let's have an idea of what parents may expect in terms of schedule or feeding. Because I know we're going to go by baby's decision of when they need to eat, but how someone, when they can sleep, how baby sleeps, we want to make sure that the new parent actually gets some rest while nursing. So we'll be right back. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Waiting on a tax return? Hopefully it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by 30% in 2023. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U.S.-based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware. Okay, we're back. So I know we don't want to set a number in someone's head like, oh, it has to be six or up to eight feedings, but they do feed, you know, they, their tummies are so small, so they feed pretty often. What do you think a new parent should just generally expect in those first couple of days? Uh, it's like not really sleeping or just kind of trudging through, making the breast available. What, what might that look like? So a lactating parent who has given birth is probably somewhat exhausted and maybe so she may have given birth vaginally and so she's having a hard time sitting up. She may have given birth by C-section. So she's having a, a, a really tough time just thinking straight because she may be experiencing some pain. Ideally, in the first couple of days after giving birth to a baby, these parents would again observe the cues. Now, 
what that means is when babies finish nursing, that's your time to take a rest. Rest can mean simply having your feet up or napping or full on sleeping if you can, because you're right. It's hard to predict when a baby will be hungry. And so the recommendation currently is anywhere between eight to 12 times for the first 48 hours. But again, that's based on the baby's desire to feed. Mm -hmm. So those are the those are the days where you're sort of keeping your baby close, noticing sounds, getting to know your baby, sort of like a first date where you're making lots of eye contact and you're checking out all the body parts and all of that, or at least the parts you can see, and offering food, sort of like a grandmother does, at every single opportunity that you notice your baby is sort of interested, meaning sucking on his hands, looking at you, um, looking around and rooting. All of these are ways that you can interest the baby in nursing, but in terms of sleeping or resting, every time that baby's not interested in eating, that's when that parent can get some rest. If I remember correctly, and you would know this better than I do, I feel like there's a shift in babies general behavior, like the first day or so, they're pretty zonked out from that big transition into mm-hmm. the world. And then they start to perk up. Is that, mm-hmm. is that right? You remember? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, the joke is, is the reason they call it labor because it's hard work for both people involved. So for parents who've given birth to their own babies or they're planning to breastfeed their baby, those first couple of days when baby is born, they're sort of chill, checking out the world, making that transition, like you said. And then once their appetite kicks in, which is usually around day two into day three, that's when breasts become engorged. So there's, there's synchronicity there. The baby says, you know, I've been nursing for a couple of days on this small meal and I think I have this whole swallowing thing down pat. So let's see what you got beside honey. Oh, you've got liquid milk. Well, then let's get some of that. And that parent will notice the breast size changing, texture changing. The milk that comes out is much more watery. And this is when that baby is ready to have um, more meals and is also aware of his or her own voice. Right. You might know it's a day three. That's when baby goes, whoa, when I yell, they all come running. I like this. (laughs) And so they they realize immediately, Okay, so there's a call and response. I call to them. They respond to me. And that response usually means I get to eat, which includes a lot of cuddling. So, yeah, you're right. They tend to perk up by day three into day four. For some babies, it takes a little longer if they've had a a harder transition into the world, perhaps spent time um, in the NICU or something, you know, in some sort of medically induced state. And so all we need to do is when we have these babies in our arms, notice their cues for, for hunger. I know it is like a feed on demand thing. So the body's only going to make what the baby needs, but at what point do we pump the extra or do we let the baby regulate? Oh, that's one of my favorite questions to answer. So let's back up a little bit, right? Okay. Because we have colostrum initially, ideally we'd have baby remove that colostrum as frequently as he or she wants to right now. If that does not happen, the swelling that we talk about with engorgement can become much more uncomfortable because think of mixing a honey vinaigrette. If you're trying to mix honey into, you know, some kind of fruit juice or, or coconut oil or olive oil or something, it takes a little longer because they're completely different textures. So if you think of it that way, the colostrum is in your breast, your breast start to produce milk and milk is more the texture of water, the consistency of water. So if that water is trying to get past the honey, that's where we get the extreme swelling that we call extreme engorgement initially. So ideally, baby gets the nurse as frequently as he or she wants, removes the colostrum from both breasts. And so when milk it starts to be synthesized from your blood, it can re- be removed as easily as baby needs to. In other words, there's no swelling. It's just your breasts are much bigger. Right. In that circumstance, if that happens, then that swelling, that excess fluid regulates itself based on baby's appetite. And this is, this is where lactation science gets a little bit weird and interesting. So stay with me on okay. that point. All right. Here's the deal. Your breasts, the person who gave birth, your breasts will become engorged and it's the baby taking milk and leaving milk behind that sets the lactation cycle for the entire journey. In other words, the baby that gets the nurse as frequently as he or she wants 
and and that parent leaves the leftovers back can create a healthier supply and a much more fun lactation journey than the parent who pumps after baby nurses because then your breasts don't know that that milk removal was done artificially. And so it creates an oversupply. Okay. I know. Yeah, no, I, I didn't think about that. So my next question that's popping in my head is those that know they're going to want someone else to help with the feedings, especially some of those middle of the night feedings, at mm-hmm. what point should they start to pump? Should it be after baby feeds or a whole separate, like an hour after baby feeds before the next feeding? Right. Well, we're assuming that this can happen right away. You know, a newborn baby is just learning how to feed him or herself. So the ideal recommendation or the current recommendation as it is today is to wait until breastfeeding is well established before we artificially remove milk or artificially bottle feed babies. So that means that can take a week. For some families, it can take up to three weeks. We want your baby to become a professional breast feeder prior to becoming a professional bottle or cup feeder. So that means the family who chooses to have help at night or at any point in the day, my recommendation is get help to do the other things that you need to get done so that that lactating parent can actually focus on recovery or bonding for people who've adopted babies or are cross nursing and focus on just having that experience of lactating for that child. In other words, nursing that child. Oh my gosh, this is so fantastic because I could imagine that there are some people, and I think I did this myself, um, that wanted to have help and so pumped pretty early so that mm-hmm. there was milk there. And what's clicking in my head is what you said about the overproduction. Oversupply. Is mm-hmm. that why people get um, the clog ducts? That's right. It's also why babies develop extreme digestive tract issues. You know, for the mom or the family who has a baby whose poops are always green or slimy or frothy and baby spitting up and gaining weight really, really rapidly, but not ever comfortable and happy. That's a family that probably started pumping too early that woman is probably producing much more milk than baby can handle. And so this baby is growing very, very rapidly because he's getting mostly four milk, which is where the human growth hormone hangs out, which is where the carbohydrates hang out. And so these babies are just miserable. They have a hard time relaxing because they're always processing food. My recommendation is hold off, wait a week, get to know this new person in your life. It's Again, it's like dating. You know, this person shows up and, you know, he or she has all these needs. And guess what? You have to meet these needs at three o'clock in the morning, which is insane. So get into that flow with baby. And then a week, maybe 10 days later, go, okay, you know what? This is where I need a little help with baby him or herself. Oh my gosh. If there's anything, I feel like the golden ticket was just given to everyone. Like, don't start pumping before the foundation is laid. I feel like if there's any piece that I want the listeners to walk away with, that is one of the main pieces. But you also just mentioned four milk. Will you talk Mm -hmm. about four milk and hind milk? Okay, I'm glad you asked, and that's why I brought it up. You know, there's a lot in the media when you look online about four milk, high milk balance, and people often confused by this. Families write to me all the time asking, well, what's the difference? Okay, so your breast synthesizes milk from your blood. That's it. The milk is synthesized. But the longer the milk sits in your breast, the more fat your breast tissue tends to reabsorb. So the milk that lets down immediately or moves out of a mother's body when she starts lactating, that milk is very watery. And if you use a breast pump, you can often see the difference Mm -hmm. between the milk that comes initially. It's sort of people will describe it as gray or green or blue or clear. And then we have milk that's more creamy and higher in fat. And that's what's called hind milk. It's the milk that's behind the milk that's in front, which is four milk. They both have their place in a baby's um, nutritional needs. The four milk has lots of water and it, and it helps baby to get hydrated immediately. And because we want babies to grow, that's where most of the human growth hormone tends to be. 
And because baby needs energy to keep suckling, that's where the carbohydrates tend to be. Mm-hmm. As baby continues to nurse beyond maybe two to five minutes, this is where the milk fats increase in the actual flow of milk. So there's no switch. People often think, well, you know, if I pump for five minutes before, then I can get all the four milk out and I can just give my baby the fatty hind milk, which is so much better. They all have their purpose. And so ideally, these babies would get to nurse as frequently as they wish and get that balance of the difference between the four milk and the hind milk. It's like a really well balanced meal. We just want. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. You want exactly. To, oh my gosh, I love this cover. I can't tell, if you could see my face, I'm like glowing. I love talking about this. <laughs> All right. So one issue that I know has come up um, in another podcast I did and, and with some students is when someone chooses to have an epidural, they have to have at least two bags of fluid before the epidural is mm. given to help because the blood pressure drops and that combats it. But then they continuously have that IV fluid, which is soaked into the body. It can, I know, inflate baby's birth weight, but it can affect breast tissue. And so where everything might have been fine in the first day or so, by that day, like two or three, the breast tissue has changed because of all that absorption and the nipple is different. Can you talk about how to get past that point? Absolutely. This baby is born latched beautifully on day one and day three things change and now this breast is flat Mm -hmm. and there's no nipple easy way to do this is what our ancestors did you get on all points of the areola by making your finger points in a circle and pushing into the areola in america they call that reverse pressure softening in other words there's so much fluid that the pressure is pushing on the areola and filling it up and it's hard for baby to get his or her mouth on it and so all we need to do is soften that areola it's something my mother taught me many years ago you get all your fingers in a point And you push, get your nipple right in the middle of all these fingers and push into your breast and give it two turns in each direction. Turns. That's like, yeah, like, like little turns as if you're waving, but with your fingers together. Think of dialing. You know, I'm doing it right now. (laughs) Of course you are. I, I imagine you're totally doing it. You think of dialing, you know, old school, if you're turning up the volume on the radio or something, um, or, or, or turning a switch that requires a turn to the left or right, your breast pump might have one of those switches. Yeah. Um, you get all your fingers on it and you turn left or right, whichever, whatever you're trying to have the machine do. So same thing with your nipples. So I call that technique dialing it in. In other words, you're pushing the milk backwards so that you can make Make room for baby's mouth to latch on. In extreme circumstances, I would ask that lactating parent to squeeze the areola to release some of this fluid. Oh, wow. Just enough, just enough, like maybe just the five or six drops to make room for baby to get his or her tongue on the areola and the hard palate on the other side, obviously, and suckle because that's swelling, that's all milk, and that's part of the process. See, this is what I think is, again, so important because I've had students say things are going well, then I, then it wasn't, and then they gave up. And mm. if they could know to get past and they didn't necessarily have the information of why it was happening, they just thought their bodies were just not meant to do it. So mm-hmm. I love that we're getting this out there, especially prenatally for those that may want to have an epidural, know that this may come up and that it's it's just part of the body flushing out all that fluid and that most importantly there's ways to get past it instead of giving up. That's right. That's oh. right. There's there's always another way, Deb. There's yeah. always another way. So another thing I hear from students, I actually did a little poll yesterday in postnatal class. I told people I was having this mm-hmm. conversation. So one student expressed that it stressed her out that because she was breastfeeding, she actually said she almost wanted to go to bottle feeding because she would know how much her baby was getting. Like she wanted to know is this many ounces. She almost switched away from that. So if you can't see, how do you know that baby's actually getting enough. Like we're, I know that you're always said like, look for the swallow to make sure they're actually swallowing. What other signs are there that, that whatever the parent is giving is enough for baby? So it's a, that I love that one because that requires a degree of trust 
right? Yeah. We need to trust our babies. A hungry baby will yell vociferously. And I'm talking about not an actual newborn, but think of a five-day-old, right? Mm -hmm. Still a newborn, still learning about this stuff. So there are three things you can do to assure yourself that your baby's adequately fed. Number one, get into the habit of feeling your breasts before and after nursing. Mm. You know, there's a difference in the sensation. The full breast, ready to feed. The softer breast, have already fed. Boom. That's number one. Two, you know, look at your baby's stomach while you're doing a diaper change. You'll notice it's kind of concave because they're empty. And the stomach, just for you listeners out there, is on the left side of baby's waist, right where the diaper meets the waist, kind of like right that by that last rib. When baby's finished nursing, maybe 45, 55 minutes later, and you lay him or her on his or her back, notice the stomach is going to poke out. You know, mm-hmm. look at your grandpa's stomach. If your grandpa has a big belly and that baby looks like grandpa's belly at the end of a breastfeeding event, chances are she's satiated. The last thing is the output. Because babies are on a liquid diet, what goes in must come out. So if baby, a five-day-old, is putting out five to seven wet diapers, and I mean not scant spritzes, I mean heavy, sodden, wet diapers, we know she's well hydrated. If we're getting at least four, maybe five or six poops in that time, and they're yellow and messy and smeared all over everything and just completely fabulous, you know your baby's getting enough. And those rules really do help most families to understand and learn to trust their baby's appetite. Because by five days, a baby will tell you if he or she is satiated by simply falling asleep. Yeah. Now, what if a baby is not producing that? Right. Well, that's where the first trick comes in. If your breasts do not feel differently after you fed your child, that's probably sends a signal that something's not quite right. Also, if your nipples are damaged and breaking down, again, it tells me that your baby's latched on to just your nipple. And, you know, nipples are like straws. If baby latches on to the nipple, think of it as, you know, drinking from a straw and biting on the straw. Mm-hmm. It restricts the flow of fluid through that straw. It's the same thing with a nipple. When babies latch onto the nipple, they put so much pressure on the nipple, the milk has a hard time flowing. So for the family who notices, well, my nipples have uh, left the building, they don't want to be here anymore, chances are that baby spends a lot of time fussing, crying, sucking on his or her hands, and is having scant output. The first line of defense is to look for an IBCLC. Mm-hmm. You know, because in, especially in the first couple of weeks in all over the planet, um, most pediatricians want to see those babies a couple of times because they're checking weight. And that's how we know objectively that baby's gaining weight. But subjectively, we can do things like checking for output, that's wets and poops, and checking one's own breasts to feel the sensation of fullness versus slightly softer after nursing. Will you also talk about should there be pain? When you were talking about nipples that were kind of a hot mess, mm-hmm. we don't want that clearly. Um, mm-hmm. But the idea, I've heard some people say like, you just have to get through the pain and then it's okay. Can you talk about should there be any level of pain? You know, getting through the pain and then it'll be okay. That's that's what I call a relationship issue, right? <laughs> you know, um, not a breastfeeding issue. So if you're in pain, any kind of nipple pain, particularly if the nipple looks like lipstick after it comes out of the baby's mouth, that's a sign that things aren't going well. And I mean from the time the baby is born because your nipple tissue, just the nipple, has more receptors for pain and pleasure. The areola tissue has receptors for pressure. In other words, pain indicates that something's not quite right. And that compression that we talked about, the breast sandwich that Joey was so excited to learn about, (laughs) that's the fix. That's the answer. All we need to do is make the nipple and the areola about the same width so that when baby latches on, he or she can get more areola in this mouth because, you know, your areola gets larger during pregnancy. So we're telling these moms, get your areola in the baby's mouth. But if you've ever looked at a three-day-old baby's mouth, it's tiny. Yeah. So we meet the baby where she is by flattening that areola. But that nipple pain, that is not normal. That should never happen. There is some expectation of sensitivity. You know, you have somebody sucking on your breast for, you know, 
six hours a day, and it's going to feel a little bit weird. But it should never hurt. The tissue should never break down. And God forbid, you should never bleed. Yeah, Aye. yeah, yeah. yeah. And I am, I know, this is not totally where this conversation is going, but <laughs> can you just give a couple of tidbits if the, if the nipple is bleeding or just needing, <laughs> needing a little right. support? Sure. Um, after you've placed an appointment with somebody who's an IBCLC, <laughs> um, go get yourself some edible organic coconut oil unless you or your partner are allergic to coconut oil. Coconut oil has been proven to be the number one product and definitely I see it in my own practice to repair nipple damage. So coconut oil, edible organic coconut oil after every single breastfeeding or the ones that you can manage and save the lanolin cream that they give you freebie at the hospital for before you take a shower. Mm. Now, that's such a great trick that um, it's become sort of standard in the business now. You use the lanolin cream outside of the shower before you go in. In other words, you don't use it between feedings because lanolin is waterproof. We can protect the nipple tissue from the dehydrating effects of water by protecting the nipple tissue prior to showering. Oh, that's brilliant. You've given birth. You really want to take a shower by at least day four. (laughs) (laughs) If not sooner. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. When, when you're ready, (laughs) that's when you put on that lanolin cream and they're vegan versions of as well. Oh, this has been so great. Okay, we're going to take one final break and we come back and you've given so many tips and so much advice, but if there's one final tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new and expectant parents, we'll be right back. Hello, it is Ryan and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. So you have given so much already. Do you have one final golden nugget to share? Absolutely. You know I do. I'm 30 years in and I <laughs> I got lots of nuggets, but I'm going to give you my favorite one. Okay. Number one tip for anybody who's bringing a baby home, take a prenatal breastfeeding education workshop. Here's why. Birthing is an event. Deb, you are one of America's finest doulas. You know that. It's over at some point. No matter how it's going to happen, this baby needs to come into the world. But guess what? This baby is going to feed every so often. It could be as, as infrequently as three hours. It could be as frequently as every hour. In other words, birthing is an event. Nursing your child, nourishing your child with your body is an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. So put more emphasis in your education on prenatal breastfeeding education. And I always recommend taking five to six classes. That's why my, I hate to say this, but my class is free because I say take the class, yes, but then go and take as many classes as your budget will allow because each of us who teach who teaches this information, bring our own knowledge, our own experience, our own perspectives to this education program. And you're going to pick up a nugget from every one of your teachers that's going to come in handy when you give birth to your new baby. Oh, I love that. And I'm going to also just add to, if it is possible, get an IBCLC. They, you and all of those I have worked with and talked to, there's just such deep knowledge. And if you can just share with people, because a lot of people don't know the depth of learning it takes mm-hmm. to become an IBCLC, which is different than just like a lactation counselor, which is wonderful, but the level of commitment that one has to do to finish an IBCLC program is huge. Do you mind sharing how long, how many hours this involves? You know, I think that has changed. Okay. Um, it's become even more rigorous than in my time. Um, you know, in my time, I had 2000 hours of hands on practice with teaching moms breastfeeding. And that was what we said in the day, teaching moms how to breastfeed. Nowadays, we recognize that we're not teaching anybody anything. We're just 
sharing knowledge with you. And so an IBCLC is a board certified lactation consultant and her or his job is to manage breastfeeding from the clinical perspective, which means it's medicalized, unfortunately or fortunately. It takes enormous amount of time and I think we're up to like 500 hours of practical hours to be, to get the certification. Well, I should say to qualify to do the certification. And within that time, you have to have an understanding, usually some kind of college level understanding of anatomy, chemistry, biology, of course, you know, how babies' mouths work, how mothers' breasts work, how lactating parents who have not given birth, you know, how we can help them to uh, make the choice to breastfeed their child um, from their body, to nurse their child from their body. That's always a big part of what we learn. And it's just managing the process of parenting. That's another thing. So, you know, to go into the details of what we have to learn in order to practice, it will take us another whole hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll pull it back at that. But one thing I always tell, this is just my opinion, so take it for with a grain of salt. When someone is looking at a registry, and I know how fun, in fact, I loved getting our baby registry. History. If someone can, it's just, again, my opinion, pull back from all the cute stuff and maybe set up uh, funds for support postpartum. Maybe it would be some hours with a postpartum doula. Maybe it would be money towards an IBCLC. My opinion is that is a gift that will continue to give far more than some cute onesies. That's just my opinion. <laughs> That's I'm with you that on there. that one. I'm a big fan of saying to everybody, okay, all my rich friends are going to give me $100 and all my not so rich friends can cough up $20, put it in a bucket at the shower, whether it's virtual or in person, and use that towards supporting the family no matter how they choose to nurse, sorry, no matter how they choose to nourish that child. Because there are lots of families who prefer to pump and bottle feed their babies. And so you want to have somebody who will support that decision. Yeah. Oh, I right? loved this conversation. Where can people find your work? My website, easily. You know, I I practice virtually now, and I've done that for about a decade and a half, 12 years, 12 or 13 years that I've done virtual work, and I continue to only do virtual work. My website is babyinthefamily.com. Oh, and I will make sure all this is in the show notes because people should find you. I feel lucky enough to have worked with you. You know, PYC is going to be 20 years uh, next mm-hmm. month, which is crazy. So, yeah, I, well, yeah. I mean, it's amazing to me. You have done such an amazing task of bringing together the best of New York to share with your families who come to you for, you know, prenatal yoga. But it turns out we walk out of there with all of this amazing knowledge. So thank you, Deb, for what you've done and your vision in educating families. Thank you. It has been truly a joy having been on this path with you for my own two kids and for all the families that you've helped at PYC and on your own. It's just, I just am a, I'm a big fan of you in every single way. So thank you. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower-than-low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details.